stage from group B9. from South Korea. Uh, I'm Sakuni from Sri Lanka. I'm not from Thailand. Okay, we we'll start. So the topic of our poster is um, Speedy reco Bone Recovery Cancer by Dr. Nanobots. Okay, uh, to begin. Uh, osteosarcoma or bone is the most common bone cancer uh, in the world. So it is high, a highly malignant cancer, meaning that it will meaning that it will spread throughout the body. Yeah. Okay. Yes, uh, switch it off. No, no. Yeah, switch it off. Sorry. Okay, uh, let's restart. Okay, osteosarcoma is a highly malignant bone cancer with a five-year survival rate of only five to 15 percent. So to put that in perspective, out of 100 people who contracted this disease and proceed to stage four, 85 will die and only 15 will survive. So that way, so that way uh, a conventional therapy is not Hello, 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 hello. Okay. So the can can you hear can you hear me? Hello, hello. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So the current treatment, which is uh, radiation chemotherapy, are highly ineffective to this cancer because of the metastasis. So we are looking at a uh, novel type of treatment called T-cell immunotherapy. In this process, the patient's T-cell uh, are removed, infected with a virus uh, that encodes for a gene for an antibody, and then re-injected into the patient. So when we inject it back, we have this or T cell that doesn't uh, see the tumor, but when the T cells see the tumor, they got activated and angry, so they start killing the tumor. Okay, if you can see, but the problem is when we when the T cells have successfully removed the tumor, the bone would the bone would have been or would have already been eroded by the cancer, so we need to repair the bone as well. So the second phase is bone recovery. What we do here is that we accelerate the natural speed of bone recovery by putting in BM2 and BMP7, which is a growth factor that accelerates the also, um, osteoplast um, differentiation. So like by putting BM2 and BM7 through magnetic nanoparticles, we accelerate the healing process. So what we do is that we have BMP2 and BMP7 in these na magnetic nanoparticles, and when we put magnetic field around it and activate them, these particles vibrate, therefore causing heat, and the polymers that are wrapped around the BMP2 is broken and it is released. So the BMP is released to the bone. 
However, there is a problem there because if we just like put the particles inside random places, these will not go to the particulate place that we want it to be. So in order for that particle to be at the particulate place that we want it to be, we have three factors. The first factor is the receptor on the particle, which is receptive to a protein called inner leukin protein, which is emitted at the size of inflammatory sites. So they find the inflammatory sites and the particle Par, uh, particles go there because of the receptor. The second is that we inject uh, uh, the magnetic particles in the part of the cancer, in the part of the injury. And the third thing is that we only activate the magnetic field in the part of the cancer and the injury. And after the, we accelerate the healing process, we go to the third phase of recovery. So in the first phase, the bone cancer has been removed and the bone has been repaired, but the bone won't be strong as it was before. So this is why we need a third phase for the re-strengthening of the bone. Now this is where the Dr. Nanobots come into play. So actually, our Dr. Nanobots are made out of DNA. So now DNA, even when introduced to the body, it is biocompatible and biodegradable. So uh, it won't incite any immunological response. So once they are introduced, like uh, they will be having a receptor to find the site of the bone where there is an excess of BMPs. Now this is resulted by our second phase because we introduce a lot of BMPs, so there will be an excess of BMPs there. So once our nanobots discover that location, it will come to that site and walk along the bone. And they will be bringing small uh, fragments of graphene. And these graphene fragments will be laid on top of the bone and this graphene is uh, used to strengthen the bone. Why we use graphene is that graphene is an allotrope of carbon, and it is like 200 times stronger than steel by weight. It will be releasing, the nanobots will be releasing enzymes to assemble the fragments of graphene on the bone, and finally, a graphene mesh will be formed around the bone, and this will be strengthening the bone. Uh, there will be a small demonstration, like a very quick one. Okay, okay. go ahead. So, okay, hello everyone. I'm Dr. Nanobot. Hey. So, uh, I'm looking for a BMP molecule, and yeah, here it is. So, here's my graphene mesh. So, like. So. Yeah, now, now the bone's strong. Thank you, that's my job. <laughs> you group, thank you, group B9. Um, next up is group D5. Could you kindly make your way to the stage, please? Is group D5 here? Okay. Can you have five minutes? Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, we are group five and we are here to talk about, uh, well, our group is about a new energy source. So uh, before we start, uh, we all have our mechanical pencils with us, do we? Do you have them around? Okay, so if you look at these uh, mechanical pencils, we all have those, uh, can, can you see them? Okay, there are the physics, there the, there's the chemistry inside. If you look at these, these are, uh, if you look at, in, at the metal part, there's the, uh, the metals, the, the springs. And if you look at how you use them, you can always see some physics related and the science related to this. And so one of the main objects that is making this is plastic, of course. And if you lose, uh, for example, so let's say you lost your uh, mechanical pencil at the train or, or at the bus, and so you are losing plastics. And so what happens when every one of us start losing plastic or we start wasting plastic? Then the earth will be filled with so many plastics left. 
Nowadays, one person per year we use 20 kilograms of plastic. It looks like one cat. It's a large number. And the plastic is really hard to declare. You must to born and die 5.6 times, then plastic will decay. It means it's used for 150 years to decay. It took a long time. So that means plastic is still in our world. And where is it? Now it has 20 million tons in our seas. That means it's 2 times 10 to power 12 piece of plastic bag in our sea now. It's very large number, and that makes our world warm, warmer, and it makes global warming. Yeah, so basically the Earth is endangered, right? We need to find some new alternative, cl cleaner fuel. Like people nowadays, they, they develop that ethanol can be used as a fuel for your car, for, for the vehicle. And ethanol, as in fact, is re renewable because it can be produced from glucose. So when you ferment the glucose, you will get ethanol. And when the ethanol combusts, you will get carbon dioxide and water. Carbon dioxide and water itself is the reactant for the photosynthesis to produce glucose. So like the cycle itself shows that ethanol is a really renewable resources. But there is the present. We, now, now we want to talk about the future. Now, uh, how do you guys normally hold your phone? I, I bet you guys hold it like, 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 like me, right? Uh, when you grip it like me, there is a heat produced from, the, from your palm of your hand when you touch the phone. The, the heat energy usually gets wasted for nothing, but we, we want to utilize the heat to convert it to electric energy by using the heat sensors, and, the, and, and it will activate the conductor. The conductor will generate the potential difference, and it will charge the, you, 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 your phone. You want to add, uh, I mean, like, uh, so if you use your, your palm to charge your phone, it, it's like you, you will produce like a clean, uh, affordable um, and, and and very practical e energy. And not only the phones. Uh, so basically, you can charge anything well w from the heat of the palm of your hand. And so, for example, you could be you know uh, charging uh, some electricity when you're sleeping on the bed or. You know, when you're opening the door, you could, the doorknob you're holding, it could be a, a good charger. And also, uh, some of the clocks, maybe it's connected with your hand, it radiates uh, some of the heat from your body. So I think it could be a, okay, yeah, so, uh, how to say, the theory is uh, related with the ZVAC effect, the CVAC effect, I don't know how to say it properly. Uh, and so I think it is uh, theoretically possible. Yeah, so our product name is Grip Charger, so like naturally charged, so like charging at the palm of your hand. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Group D5. Maybe in 10 years, at the next science, Asian Science Camp, we'll be using one of these chargers. So next is Group D12. Please welcome it to the stage. So for all the presenters, uh, please introduce yourself briefly before you start as well. Thank you. Talk about the double pendulums. Double a double pendulum is a pendulum. Could you introduce yourself, please, as well? Could you introduce yourself, each of the presenters. <laughs> I'm Aska from Japan. Uh, my name is Mohammad Ikmal. I'm from Malaysia. 
My name is Yen Chuan. I'm from Singapore. Uh, my name is Dad. I'm from Vietnam. My name is So Danit. I'm from Cambodia. So, we will talk about the double pendulums. A double pendulum is a pendulum with another pendulum attached to its end. It is a simple physical system, but it can exhibit rich dynamic behavior with, with a strong sensitivity to initial, to initial conditions. So I'll be talking a bit about the physics of the double pendulum. So I'll first start off on the um, top right side of the elephant. So the physics of the double pendulum is actually quite complicated. Um, to solve it, we will actually use the Lagrangian, considering both the potential and kinetic energies of the system. So um, after some mathematics, we'll actually um, derive four coupled, coupled, um, coupled differential equations. And by numerically solving these four equations, because these are not analytically solvable, we will then obtain the, the trajectory of the second bob, the bottom one, on the right hand side, the, the red path. So using this path, we can actually plot um, what, what may not be so clear is the x against t graph, that is the displacement against time graph. And using this displacement against time graph, we can then obtain um, a table. This, this table is, um, gives us the displacement of the, uh, of the second pendulum bob at every single point in time. Um, discrete points in time where um, t is given in 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4 seconds. So we thought about it to ourselves. What can this um, physics phenomenon actually give us? We want to um, find some way to actually apply it to our real life. So um, what we thought about is perhaps um, random numbers can actually be very useful in our um, daily lives for um, this topic called crypt cryptography. And okay, because um, cryptography is actually a, a very big part of all, our, all of our lives. All right. So based on the random number generated, we can actually apply it to encrypt and decrypt messages. So if you, uh, for that example, if we were to like send a hello as a message, so we would refer to that H as the eighth letter, um, E as the fifth letter, L as the twelfth, and so on. And then the next step is we would take the random numbers generated just now to actually make a change to the corresponding number just now. So eight plus zero would be eight, and five minus three would be two. So it would actually generate a new set of letters. Uh, so the so the application of the double pendulum that you can use the uh, double pendulum to send code. For example, uh, yeah, with uh, okay, uh, with uh, without the pendulum, um, the elephant A send a letter to elephant B. Another hacker can easily uh, access into the system and know what he is saying. But if he have the uh, pendulum. Uh, even another hacker ha can hack into a system and know um, about the code. Um, he can still not know what the word, uh, the code here is mean. So um, even when he knows that the elephant A is use a um, double pendulum to uh, make the code, he cannot uh, know exactly the uh, location of the two pendulum. He can only know the near uh, location. To conclude, Okay. Being a chaotic system, the ball pendulum is, um, if there are any small change in the initial conditions of the double pendulum, there will be resulting in the exponentially increasing uh, discrepancies of the consequence. Because of this factor, we, uh, the ball pendulum is considered a very suitable um, a suitable system to use in the encryption and the uh, decryptions. And presenting this poster, we hope that uh, you all of you get to know one um, PC call system and its application in our real life, which is very important. Thank you. So that's from group D12. Um, next up is group B14.
Good afternoon. I am Jung Yup Kim from South Korea. Can you get it? Uh, my name is Azrina Saraswati Karyadi. I'm from Indonesia. Hi, I'm Zarina Abdon from Philippines. And, and just a moment, please. Hi, I'm Isaac from Singapore. Okay. So as you may know, breast cancer is a huge issue in Asia. Although there's not much number of cases of breast cancer in Asia compared to those of Western countries, Breast cancer cases in Eastern countries are increasing at such a rapid rate, which is much faster than Western countries due to changes in lifestyle and diet. Therefore, uh, we were trying to sol find a solution to this. And you may know about the conventional um, chemotherapy. The, the thing that is wrong with chemotherapy is it doesn't just destroy cancer cells, it also destroys normal cells. So we're trying to find a safer, much healthier alternative to chemotherapy. And we think gene therapy could be just a thing. So we tried to do research on it to figure out whether it's a yay or a nay. We're basically going to talk about engineered T cells. And my friend Isaac will let you know how it works. OK, so basically for uh, engineered T cells, Firstly, we uh, where's the button? Okay, so uh, over here we we remove your white blood cells from your body. Okay, I'm so nervous the thing is shaking. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, so we remove your white blood cells from the body. So we uh, then we use uh, transduction to uh, add a, a gene as a as a vector to add a gene into your white blood cells. So your white blood cell will then express uh, these receptors. Uh, we just reset this all over your cells, and then uh, you'll be able to recognize cancer cells and uh, destroy them. So the benefit of this is that uh, co conventional treatments like chemotherapy are uh, not really localized and not specific, and this destroys normal cells, which is quite bad for your body. So with this mechanism, we'll be able to target your uh, specific harmful cancer cells in your body. So my friend here will tell you about the benefits of uh, using uh, more engineering T cells? Okay, first, it is highly specific and it will only target to destroy the cancer cells and bring no harm to the normal ones. Second, there's no chance of autoimmunity since the cells that are injected into the body will not be recognized as foreign and so your immune system will not attack it. Third, it has shown to have high success rate and potentials having few side effects. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so now I'll tell you about some limitations to this uh, solution, uh, to, about this method. So firstly is the size of the gene. So if the gene we want to uh, put into the vector is too huge, we want to put in the cell, the white blood cell is too huge, and if the, vac the viral vector is too small, then this will be a problem in the delivery mechanism. And then secondly, another problem is uh, when we integrate a gene into the body, that we may accidentally activate or inactivate certain genes in the body which may result in uh, cancer. So this is, pot is a, also a potentially carcinogenic method. And thirdly, when we, uh, how many of you want to look beautiful and uh, want to be very intellectual? Nobody? <laughs> Yes, yes. Imagine, imagine you are able to you are able to do that, but the person next to you is not able to do that. How would you feel? Yeah. So this is a uh, third problem is uh, it's an ethical issue because when we have the, all this uh, gene te uh, gene therapy and this technology, people may abuse it to uh, like uh, like increase their intellectual cognitive ability or their physical appearance, make them look better. So this is a very touchy and uh, controversial issue that we have to be very prudent and tech about. Um, we think that gene therapy has a huge potential. Uh, genetic and engineering technology is continuously developing and significant advances on ca gene therapy on cancer treatment has been made. Um, if, do you guys know about cystic fibrosis? 
Cystic fibrosis is basically um, an autosomal recessive gene that is expressed and people can get ill because of the re two recessive genes are expressed and people are injecting the normal gene so that the normal gene are hoped to, I mean the normal allele is hoped to be expressed rather than the recessive ones. So as you can see, uh, it has great potential, limited by ethical concerns, but we believe there's a bright future for it. However, there's some improvements that could be made. There are two main, prob two main problems that we are facing right now. Uh, first, no, it's not the problem. Um, first, the, the success rate of gene transduction from virus to white blood cell is very low. And second, the effectiveness of the vector, the virus, and the vector delivery system is not good. It's not that effective. So, so um, we, we have to improve these two problems by advances, advancing on basis and clinical research. Thank you. Thank you, group um, B14. It's interesting that uh, all the times only the guys are holding the poster, which actually debunks a misconcept that male can actually get breast cancer as well. <laughs> Next up is group B6. Could you kindly make your way up to the stage, please? Hello, uh, I'm Cheng Ge from China, and I'm Mai from Thailand. And I'm Pratika Bushar from Nepal. I'm Fadila from Indonesia. I'm Yao Qianhui from Taiwan. First, can I ask you guys a question? Do you know how many leftovers are there in the world per year? Do anyone know that? Okay, I will give you the answer. That is about 1,300 million tons a year. That is a big number, I think. And how we can do with those leftovers? And then our group came up with the idea. Why don't we obstruct the proteins in the leftovers and making the proteins into products like the artificial hearts, artificial bones, and even artificial meats and artificial clothing. Why not we do that? And also, we know spider. spiders can make a special kind of silk, which is called spider silk. And the spider silk is considered to be very strong and had a had many other mechanic properties, such as it can stand severe temperatures. So we know that the proteins in the spider silk is very strong. Then we think protein is possible for us to use as a new kind of material. But how? How to build some new proteins with those leftovers? That is a new question for us. Then we designed a, a special machine. And let me invite my friends, Mai, to in introduce this machine for you. Thank you. So, okay. okay, this machine will turn this into this, you know, that. And uh, this uh, process is divided into three parts. The first is decompose. You have to decompose the leftover into single amino acid, and then decide decide what protein you want, and last is produce. So here, start here. You put the leftover in here, and uh, it will cut to into the small piece, and then here is the lysate tank. So you can lysate the cell and get protein out of the cell, and get to the HPLC and separating the protein and go to the enzyme tank and digest the protein into single amino acid. And here, the nanobots section. For you can design whatever 
protein you can think and let the robot work. The robot, each robot, specific for each amino acid. So it will work to combine uh, each amino acid into the new protein. And also you can add some other element that can improve the property of protein than in here, the product. Thank you. I'm going to ask that. Um, is there anyone curious about our topic? What is proterial? Uh, I got. I going to talk about this. Um, we combine two words together: protein and material. So we want to make a new material by protein. Uh, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Thank you, yeah. <laughs> uh, our new material, which is called proterial, is considered to have many advantages. The first advantage is it is very strong, just like the spider silk. Also, it is a new kind of nanomaterial, so it is very light. And the material is full of possibility because we can design the proteins by ourselves. And the structure and sequence can design by you guys. You can design by yourselves. So it is full of possibility. Also, it is committable. Uh, com com uh, it is degradable and uh, environmental friendly because it is made of protein. So it can be degraded easily. It will do no harm to the environment. And uh, we hope in the future, the proteal will change the world. And our slogan is proteal without limits, change the world. Thank you. Thank you, group B6. Uh, we learned a new word today, proteal. <laughs> so last but not least, group B4. Please welcome them to the stage. introduce all of you guys. Yeah. And on you do it quickly. Okay. <laughs> Hello ladies and gentlemen. We're group B04 and I'm Hyun Song from South Korea. You can call me Linus. This is An from Thailand. This is Olivia from New Zealand. This is Michelle from Guam. And this is Shua from Palestine. Now, I'd also like to ask a question. Do you guys know the super string theory? Okay. Uh, it's a theory that try attempts to um, like combine the forces in the universe. Now, what we wanted to do was that we wanted to propose a super string theory for Asian science camp. Now, there were several lectures, actually seven lectures, with different um, topics for this camp. And what we wanted to do was that we wanted to find a common ground for all of these topics. And the common ground that we reached was life. And for this, and for us, for our poster, we also wanted to show the diverse aspects of life, the relative aspects of life. And so we showed the um, life on the microscopic level, life on the macroscopic level, and my, uh, life on the social level. And without further ado, my friend An will show the first part. Okay, for the first part is life under a microscope. I would like to present you about HIV drug synthesis and delivery. Uh, now today, nearly 37 million people are now living with HIV virus. However, synthesis of a drug of a HIV drug is highly inefficient and the drug necessitates frequent dosing. So we have two problems to solve. The first problem is about low organic synthesis of local synthetic yields. You will see the structure that is A and B that are substrate and you will get uh, the C that is everyday carrier duct is named of a drug. And you will get a byproduct that is hydrogen iodide. So we 
uh, get inspiration from a uh, lecture about, uh, from your professor Yuan Terry about uh, the technique that's called cost molecular beam method. So from this method, we can get 100% yield and more efficient than the synthesis in chemical laboratory. Uh -huh. uh, uh, you can see you can't see the beam, but uh, the beam is uh, collide the collide the particle A and particle B each other directly in 180 degree, and you will get uh, particle C that is everyday every day dark that we want in the collection box, and uh, we don't want hydrogen iodide, so we didn't collect the hydrogen iodide. So. By this method, we can get 100% yields and more efficient than the O1. And the second problem is about daily dosing required. We uh, can solve this problem by using osmotic drug delivery system. It's about subcutaneous implant. Uh, when the uh, patient go to doctor, the doctor can uh, give this device, uh, can put this device, uh, put that device uh, under the subcutaneous layer uh, under the skin, and you will see that uh, there are two membrane. That is that uh, outer membrane and inner membrane. Uh, outer membrane is permeable to water, but cannot be expand, expandable. But uh, in the opposite way, inner membrane can uh, can can expand, but is impermeable to water. So and uh, the dark, the pink color is the dark. Every day, we dark that uh, inside this device. Uh -huh. And when the, the water under the skin osmos inside, uh, the inner membrane will squeeze out the dark every day. So we can solve the problem about uh, a patient must uh, have a dark every day, but uh, this device can be last six months or one year. Uh, for it depend on the type of polymer that is uh, inner membrane and out outer membrane are made from. Okay, so An showed you the um, uh, how to like how we can control and uh, view life on the microscopic level. Now on the second part for uh, life on the macroscopic level. Now I want to say that life it's a very complex thing and it involves many organisms, the interaction of many organisms. But the thing is that in these days, due to environmental pollution, um, a lot of organisms are uh, not being able to habitat in on Earth. So what we wanted to do was that we wanted to uh, target a few problems and um, provide some solutions for um, this issue. So we targeted two problems, uh, waste disposal and soil uh, uh, purification. And the solutions we provided was that for the first problem, we, uh, uh, sorry, we, uh, we thought about building plastic uh, uh, bottle greenhouses for this problem. And for the second problem, we thought about utilizing uh, earthworms to solve this problem. And now, after this, I'd like to show you, uh, I'd like to give my, uh, the mic. Kia ora everyone. Uh, so as Lana said before, I'm going to talk about the social aspect of science and life. Uh, so over the week, our group was inspired by a researcher, uh, excuse me if I say this wrong, uh, Nisara, Nisara, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, but she was an amazing uh, inspirational speaker and her topic was about uh, the road not taken. And really, uh, she inspired us as well as Professor Lee to uh, uh, work together and uh, create a better future for our generation, a sustainable future. So how we're going to do that is we're going to induct uh, environmental policy without punishment. And that is how we're going to improve our society. Thank you for listening to us. Thank you, Group B4, which is the last presenter of this session. So next up will be the closing ceremony, but before we uh, get to it, please give everyone another round of applause. Great job, everyone.